Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a good Tuesday wherever you are in this crazy world we live in. My eyes popped open at 3.58 this morning, so that's why you're getting an episode really early today. I've been at it for hours, y'all. If you're watching on YouTube, you know what to do. Don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. You can ring my bell if you want notifications of whenever I post new content. Just click on that little bell icon. It'll let you know as soon as I upload something new. Music fact of the day. Your girl's going to see Stevie Nicks tomorrow night. Cannot wait. What song inspired Prince to write When Doves Cry? That song would be The Edge of Seventeen by none other than Stevie Nicks. Also, what Prince song inspired Stevie to write her hit song, Stand Back, Little Red Corvette. By the way, Prince played keyboards on Stand Back. We read through the burn after reading the letter in a previous episode, but I'm going to reread it because the last part of Roberta's deposition focused on this very letter. I just want you to remember I will always love you, and I know you will always love me. You are my boy. Nothing can make me stop loving you. Nothing will or could ever divide us no matter what we do or where we go or what we say. We will always love each other. If you're in jail, I will bake a cake with a file in it. If you need to dispose of a body, I will show up with a shovel and garbage bags. If you fly to the moon, I'll be watching the skies for your reentry. If you say you hate my guts, I'll get new guts. Remember that love is a verb, not a noun. It's not a thing. It's not words. It is actions. Watch people's actions to know if they love you, not their words. Therefore, I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor the ruling spirits, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers from above, nor powers from below, Nothing in the entire create world can separate our love. Neither hostile powers, nor messengers of heaven, nor monarchs of earth. Nothing has the power to separate us. That is Romans 8.38, the extended version. Nothing can separate us, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not threats, not even sin, nor the thinkable or unthinkable can get between us. Not time, not miles and miles and miles. The letter was encased in an envelope that said, Brian Christopher Laundry, burn after reading. The attorneys start to question Roberta about this letter. It's undated. The first page has a bird drawn on it. She said that was stationary she made, but it was not drawn on. They ask if there's significance about the bird, and she said, no, I have a frog, bird, and a chicken. They ask why she wrote remember on the front, and Roberta said remember dot, dot, dot. I will always love you. So if you open it up, it's all about how I will always love you. So it was like, remember, I'll always love you. They ask why it's not dated. She said, I didn't think to date it. I don't always date notes. They ask when she gave that letter to Brian. She said before he was leaving for his, and then she stops and says him and Gabby's trip, May 21st. She wrote it right before they left, just a few days prior. The attorney points out that previously she testified she thought that Gabby and Brian were just going to New York. Roberta says, seeing them empty the storage unit, I was beginning to suspect they were going to be gone longer. Now, if you remember, he emptied that storage unit when he came home in August before Gabby was killed. She's asked, why did you write it then? And she said, because I thought he may be going away a little longer. I knew he was going away. I was going to miss him. And I wanted to make sure he knew I loved him. He was going away. I was disappointed, but it didn't matter because we had gotten in that little thing about I thought you were living here and saving your money. I didn't want him to think I was disappointed in him or didn't love him. So whatever he decided to do, I would always, always, always love him. They didn't have a disagreement about him leaving, but she did express to Brian she was disappointed. She said, I waited for us to move in together. After I went back to New York, I couldn't wait for all of us to live together. I know it's silly. He's a grown boy, but I thought he'd live with us a while and save money. I know he wanted to buy a house, so I expressed I was disappointed. But he's a grown boy. He can do what he wants. I just thought maybe we were growing apart, and we were growing apart because he was growing up. He's not a little boy anymore. They asked if she wrote it because she was concerned he didn't know she loved him. She thought he may be concerned because she was disappointed, and he might think, I don't love him. 
I wanted to reassure him I loved him no matter what. No matter if he moved away, stayed out west, whatever he did, I would always love him. They want to know why she wrote Burn After Reading on it. Roberta said Gabby bought Brian a book. It was called Burn After Writing. And it was how you could put your deepest thoughts down. And if they were embarrassing and you didn't want anybody to read them, the advice on the book was just to burn it. So it was like a little joke that I knew he would get. He would know what I was referring to. And I did want him to get rid of it. It's an embarrassing note. The attorney points out that's what somebody writes on letters they don't want to be discovered. She says, yes, it was embarrassing. And I didn't want, you know, yeah, it's a silly letter. He's a grown boy, and it was a joke, really. He didn't have to destroy it, and now I think it's sweet he saved it. It was just a little joke. The attorney asked why she felt the need to say, you're my boy. Nothing can stop me from loving you. Nothing will or could ever divide us. She said, I guess I was being over the top, mushy, and emotional. So he knew we were always, even if he grew up, he would always be my little boy. If he's 40 or 50 years old, he'll always be my boy and nothing could ever divide us. They ask, nothing including murder could make you stop loving him? She said, oh, I would always love him. They go on to read, no matter what we do or where we go or what we say, we will always love each other, no matter what. And they ask, including murder? She says, well, I didn't say including murder, but you know, I would always love my boy, no matter what. They move on, and if you say you were in jail, I will bake a cake with a file in it. What led you to believe he might be in jail? Roberta said she went out with a series of silly examples of things that were far-fetched. I would never actually think he would end up in jail. He was such a nice, good boy. I would never imagine it. Just like if you read on, I would never imagine that he would ever go to the moon. I don't think he was suddenly going to astronaut school and then go to the moon. I was just exaggerating and silly. I tend to be, I don't know, I don't seem jokey, but I'm always intending to, I always joke. Even my Tide Sticks was a joke. I'm always doing jokes, even if they're not good jokes. I'm always joking, so I was making it light. If you go to jail, if you go to the moon, if you do that no matter what, I'll love you, love you, love you. It was just a silly letter. I never imagined the future when I wrote this. They ask if she understood he could have gone to jail for murder. And she says, not when I wrote the letter and not ever. I wasn't actually going to put a file in a cake. Who does that? The attorney says, what would lead you to think he might go to jail? She said, nothing. What would lead me to think he would go to the moon? Nothing would lead me to think he would go to the moon. The attorney moves on and says, Next, you say if you need to dispose of a body, I'll show up with shovels and garbage bags. What led you to believe he might need to dispose of a body? So Roberta says, I know. Okay, so this is crazy. Somebody told me a joke and I thought it was funny. And I told people at work. I told Brian. I thought it was the funniest joke. Somebody said to me, oh, you know, a good friend is somebody that shows up with garbage bags and a shovel. Somebody you can call at three in the morning. They show up with garbage bags and a shovel and they don't ask questions. Haha, -ha, that is so funny. Like, that's how you know a good friend. I thought it was a funny joke. The person that told me said it was funny and I told it to Brian. I thought it was such a funny joke. So I was referring to the joke. But I didn't have time to write out the whole joke because I knew he would know the joke that I would always be there, y'all. The attorney says your intent in writing this letter was to express the depth of your love for him, but you don't say whatever you do in life, I'll be proud of you. She says, I know that would have been better. They say you don't talk about what a great childhood he had, memories of him, places you've gone together. You don't talk about what he did to make you love him the way you do. She says correct, but she does have other letters like that. They point out, we're talking about this letter, which talks about jail and murder. Roberta said she didn't write it in this letter, but she had written other letters like that. The attorney says, but you don't say any of those things. You talk about jail and burying a body. She said it was a poor choice of words. When I read this letter, I was like, this sounds awful, but it was nothing. It was a jokey, stupid letter that I dashed off before he left with lots of bad jokes and poor humor, but that's not how I intended it, and I never imagined any of this. It sounds so bad now, but at the time I wrote it, it was just jokey and stupid. I do have letters I've written that list all of his good qualities, listing good memories. I've written tons of letters like that. They point out, but you didn't put it in this one, and she says, I know, but I should have. I wrote this stupid one. The attorney says this was written around the time he murdered Gabby. And she says way before. 
in May before they went on the trip. And the attorney says, well, we have to take your word for that, right? And she says, yes. They talk about the sentence. If you need to dispose of a body, I will. And you have bring. And bring is crossed out. Why is bring crossed out? She said she was trying to remember how the joke went. And then I remembered it was show up. You know, the joke was a good friend shows up with a shovel and garbage bags. The attorney says, so baking, you're aware, are you not, that if you put a file in a cake and give it to someone in prison, that's a crime? She said, yeah, but it's also a very funny joke in movies, you know, somebody filing their way out of jail with a file. As a matter of fact, the movie I was thinking of when I wrote it was a Wes Anderson Hotel Budapest, where she bakes beautiful pastries, and in each one, she puts a tiny spoon, and the guy digs himself out of jail. It was just a joke because you can't dig yourself out of jail. You can't file your way out of jail. It was silly. They move on to say, you realize that offering to help dispose of a body would be a crime? She said, of course, but it was a joke. You wouldn't really do that. It's like joking. When I went to work in the World Trade Center, on the top floor, they had a place where tourists could come and you could get your picture taken leaping off the World Trade Center. It was very funny. And you'd put on a funny face and then you pay $10 and get a picture of yourself falling off the World Trade Center. That was so funny. Everybody had funny faces, and I'm saying this because at the time it was a joke. Later, when people actually did fall off the World Trade Center, it was not so funny. The attorney says, well, this isn't funny now. Now that we know your son murdered Gabby, is it? And she said, exactly. They asked why she chose Romans 8.38 to quote in her letter. She said she loves that verse because it shows how we can never be separated from God and the love that God has for us. She said, so I kind of used it to show that that's how powerful my love is. Just the way we cannot be separated from God, our love could not be separated by anything that ever, anything, you know? How is it worded? Things not here, things to come. Nothing in the world could separate our love. I just thought it was a very beautiful expression of love, and I used to say it. That's how much I, so the attorney's like, okay, let's look at, and then she says, love Brian. The attorney says, I'm sorry. Let's look at the language in parentheses at the bottom of the second page. It says, nothing can separate us, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not threats, not even sin, not the thinkable or unthinkable can get between us. Murder is a sin, isn't it? And she said, yes. It's unthinkable, isn't it? Yes. Weren't you writing this to him to tell him that no matter what he did, you'd still love him and nothing could come between you? She said, the reason I did this in parentheses is because in my Bible, this is how Romans 8.38 is worded. But when I looked it up in the King James Version, they actually use, or I don't know, maybe it wasn't King James Version, these words. And I said, oh, those words are nice too. Should I put the original or this version of Romans, or should I put this version of Romans? So I squeezed it in at the end in parentheses. I had a little space, and that's where I wrote the extended version. There's two versions, depending on what Bible you read. And I'm like, that's a nice version too, but I was just saying, the word for just exaggerating Oh, no matter what happens, I'll love you. The attorney asked Roberta, can you understand how it sounds like you're suggesting he did something wrong and you're telling them that nothing could come between you? She said, I could see how somebody could read it that way now, but at the time, that's not how I intended it. The attorney says, you end it by saying not time, not miles, and miles and miles. Were you encouraging him to run away? And she said, no. That just meant no matter how far apart we were, if we went to another planet, went to the moon, our love was just so, I love him. I love him. I always will. Maybe I'm just too dramatic. They give her an affidavit and have her turn to a certain page and paragraph. It says, the purpose of the letter was to reach out to Brian while he and I were experiencing a difficult period in our relationship. They ask, what was that difficult period? She said he was leaving home and, you know, he had a new girlfriend, so we were not spending as much time together and nothing big. Not what it was when he was little. He was growing up. And I guess I was having more trouble with it than anything. I wish my kids would stay little, but I just wanted to reassure him that I loved him. Things were changing. He's growing up. He's taking a trip I wasn't thrilled with and just difficult. The attorney says, you found out about the trip, I believe you said, a couple of weeks before they left, right? 
She said, I think it was like less than a week. The attorney says, but in the next sentence, you say, in the months prior to the trip, our relationship had become strained. Why was it strained? She said, like I was saying, we weren't spending time together. I don't know. It just wasn't the same as it was. The attorney says, then you go on to note, Brian and I shared a love of stories and some of the language in the letter was using similar phrases to determine the depth of a mother's love. The two books that come to mind are The Runaway Bunny and Little Bear. What language in those books do you think is similar to the phrases you used in your letter? She said, well, I know in Little Bear, he went off to the moon. And the mother bear, you know, that's a picture of her waiting to come back. And he comes back from the moon to see his mother bear. And then The Runaway Bunny was just how no matter what the bunny did, she would always love him. I forget the exact book. I mean, I forget the exact lines, but whatever the bunny did, she would always love him. The attorney says, well, there's nothing in those books about burying a body, is there? And she said, no, nothing in the books about going to jail, is there? She said, no, but that was from the joke and the book from Gabrielle. It was sort of a combination of those different references that I knew Brian would recognize. They have her turn the page in the affidavit that they gave her. And paragraph eight says, I repeat that the letter I wrote to Brian was before he left with Gabby for their fateful trip was nothing more than a private communication between myself and my son. And I never expected anyone else would read it. What do you mean by fateful trip? She said, well, we wrote that after. I mean, well, I wrote it and then my attorney helped me write it and we didn't know at the time it was fateful until now we know it's fateful. You know, that trip ended terribly. Lord, you don't say, Roberta. The attorney says, well, one of the definitions of fateful is ominous, meaning, you know, that something's going to happen. Were you aware of that? She said, well, yes. I mean, because now we know something happened. So it was a fateful trip because that's how you... Then she said, it's sort of like the Titanic. That was a fateful trip. They didn't know it was going to sink, but it was like, oh, that fateful trip. The attorney says, like a three-hour tour? She said, yeah, right. Was the word fateful in that? Because they didn't know and they took it. The attorney says, Miss Laundry, were you aware that biblical scholars interpret Romans 8.28 to be about murder? She said, no. So that was it for her burn after reading explanation. I don't know. You're not going to convince me she didn't write that after he came back, after he murdered Gabby, and before he left. Maybe you guys feel differently? Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. Hope you guys have a good rest of your Tuesday. We'll see you soon.